Abraham Lincoln actually attended Ford Theater several times throughout his presidency prior to the night that he was assassinated. But on this particular night in November of 1863, he went to see a play called The, the Marble Heart. Nothing of real note otherwise, except that the lead actor in that play was a, a dashing young gentleman named John Wilkes Booth. So Abraham Lincoln actually attended a play at the site that he would be assassinated to watch his assassin about 18 months before the assassination happened. So that was, that was um, the anniversary of that event was, was last week. So um, it's it, particularly though, even setting that one aside, when you think of the, the anniversaries of the, of the JFK assassination and the Gettysburg address, two huge historical events that, that took place within a week of each other and exactly 100 years apart. I guess that's what you would call a coincidence. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about here tonight. And I think the, the best place to start is with a definition of what a coincidence actually is. And, and the, the technical definition of, of a coincidence is a remarkable concurrence of events, events or circumstances without apparent causal connection. That's a little dry, uh, accurate, but dry. I prefer how writer Emma Bull described it. She said, coincidence is the word we use when we can't see the levers and pulleys. That's a little more poetic and a little more accurate, I think, a little more fun. And usually there's nothing really special about a, a coincidence. They they happen all the time. It's several coincidences all lined up that, that kind of make you wonder, is this something else? Is this something beyond a coincidence? Throughout history, there have been natural similarities and connections between events and, and people. Um, wars, for instance, ebb and flow in various ways, similar ways caused by similar events, so on and so forth. But there's really nothing like the Lincoln-Kennedy similarities. These are just eerie. I mean, there's, there's not too many words other to describe it other than eerie. They're inexplicable. And it's that sort of spooky element that it is what attracted me to these coincidences in the first place. That and, and this, what you're looking at there on the screen, that poster. So when I was about 10 or 11 years old, I was in a museum gift shop. I can't remember where exactly or what the museum was, but killing time in a gift shop and saw this poster in a, in a rack of, of other, other historical leaning posters, this list of coincidences between the, the Lincoln and Kennedy assassinations and between Lincoln and Kennedy as, as people. And I was just completely fascinated by this right away. I knew even at that young age, I knew a little bit about both assassinations enough at least to recognize these details and recognize that they were uh, they were accurate. And I just couldn't believe that this was all true. Turns out they aren't all true. Not everything on this poster is true. We'll get to that in a minute. But most of them were. And the, the gist of the thing was was correct. And the big ones on the list are probably ones you're, you're familiar with or have heard of before. For instance, Lincoln and Kennedy, each each of their names both have seven letters. Both were elected to the presidency exactly 100 years apart. Both were killed on a Friday sitting next to their wives. Both were succeeded by vice presidents named Johnson, who those two gentlemen named Johnson were both born exactly 100 years apart. Both of their names had exactly 13 letters. Both Lincoln and Kennedy were shot in the same way from in the head from behind. And both of their assassins were killed soon after the assassination before being brought to trial. And then both of their assassins have the same number of letters in their in their full names, 15 letters. So individually, you take those one by one. There's none of them are that crazy, but you string them all together and, and they kind of are. It kind of becomes something else, um, especially when you compare them to the other two presidential assassinations in American history, which throughout my book, I refer to that as our control group. Because when you look at the assassination of James Garfield in 1881, William McKinley in 1901, there's no connection between either between those two individually or between either of those two and either the Lincoln-Kennedy assassination. There's really nothing. Nothing's compared to when you hold up the Lincoln and Kennedy assassinations individually to each other. So naturally, when you look at this list and, and start to process it, the first question that comes to mind is, how did this list happen? Who put this together? A normal, regular person might pick up on one or two examples of similarities between one event and another or one person and another, but it takes somebody special. It's like someone had to notice more and be able to put them all together under one umbrella. And so the natural question is, what kind of a mind does that? And the answer is the mind of, of this guy. 
on the screen here. Martin Gardner was his name. Uh, technically, he was a writer. He was a math and science writer. And culturally, we we tend to throw the term genius around pretty casually. But but this guy was the real deal. He was big into puzzles, philosophy, magic, and mathematics. He wrote uh, just amazing columns for Scientific American for 25 years on topics and ideas that would just blow your mind. He wrote over 70 books uh, and got countless people interested in math, which, which is not, not easy to do. But more importantly, he showed us all a new way to think, a different way to think. And so he was the first one to really notice all of these coincidences and put them all together. But not really, in a way. He claimed that Dr. Matrix was the, was the real one who noticed. Dr. Matrix, first of all, great name, Dr. Matrix, Dr. Irving Matrix. It wasn't real. Dr. Matrix is not a real person. He was a satirical fictional character that, that Gardner had created as a way of introducing new thoughts and ideas into his columns, kind of a fun way. So he would start out a column by saying, oh, I got a letter from Dr. Matrix and then go on into whatever he was talking about that month. And Dr. Matrix had a whole backstory. He claimed to be the reincarnation of Pythagoras. He, he was a, an orphan who performed magic tricks on the street at, at 13. And he picked up the name Dr. Matrix to, as his perform, to perform as a performing name. And as he grew up, he became an astrologer, for lack of a better term. Uh, his actual title, he called himself a numerical consultant. Uh, people would sought would seek out his advice and and want to hear his predictions on on the future for either personal or otherwise. And it was all based on math, all based on some form of logic. And so Dr. Matrix would send Gardner letters. And it was all sort of an in-joke between Gardner and his and his readers. But some people actually believed Dr. Matrix was real and asked to like meet him. And so Gardner would have to kind of let him gently in on this on this joke. So the story goes that about a week after the Kennedy assassination in late 1963, Gardner got a letter from Dr. Matrix, and that letter basically included the list that would evolve into what turned up on this poster. Gardner didn't write a column about it. That probably would have been in bad taste uh, right after the assassination. But the list sort of passed around from person to person. It made its way through the corridors of government and business in New York and Washington. And eventually, both Time and Newsweek got a hold of it, picked it up. And about a year later, each of them ran stories uh, on this list. It's just kind of a fun, <laughs> look at this, isn't this amazing kind of thing. And that's when the bastardization and liberties uh, with the list began that I alluded to before. So things, the little subtle differences that kind of were added to make it a little different or make it a little more impactful that weren't exactly true. And that eventually turned up on the poster. So for instance, on the poster, it says that Kennedy had a John Kennedy had a secretary named Lincoln who warned him not to go to Dallas prior to the assassination, where Lincoln had a secretary named Kennedy who warned him not to go to the theater that night. Now, one part of that is absolutely true. John Kennedy had a secretary named Evelyn Lincoln for many, many years. That's true. Kennedy did have a secretary named Lincoln. And in the original list that Martin Gardner put together before other people started to kind of put their own little flavor into it, the, the original note was that Lincoln had a secretary named John, alluding back to John Kennedy. And that is true. Lincoln did have two personal secretaries. Both of them were named John. So it, you can stretch a little bit and say that one is true. But neither Evelyn Lincoln nor either of Lincoln's secretaries, there's no evidence of any of them warning either president not to go anywhere. So there's no evidence that that part is true. So someone kind of threw that in as a, as, as a, an additional little ingredient there that's not true. So there's a couple other little things through there. But overall, this is just entertainment, right? Like it's 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 similar to like when you look up into the night sky and look up at the constellations. We look at these stars and planets and see pictures when there's really nothing there connecting these stars and planets. It's just our perspective kind of taking something that is there and, and seeing things that aren't and just kind of having fun with it. So that being said, this list of coincidences that turned up on this poster does parallel another list that is a little bit darker. And it all centers around this guy on the screen here, William Henry Harrison. And here's where we slip into the campfire story portion of the program. As we talk about the curse of Tippecanoe, or also known as the presidential curse, now, before we get into the real granular details, the basic, the primary details of this 
story are absolutely true. That being that every single president elected in a year ending in zero from 1840 to 1960 died in office. That's seven presidents over 120 years. No doubt about it. That is true. That is factual. In and of itself, that's pretty creepy, right? Turns out there's possibly an origin story to this. You can take it or leave it. But it starts with the first president to die in the string, and that's William Henry Harrison there on the screen. So 30 years before he became president, he was a military leader and was now the, the American Midwest. He led a battalion of soldiers into the Battle of Tippecanoe, which is it was near a Native American village in what is now northern Indiana, where many tribes had gathered with the goal of forming their own nation in North America. In this battle, Harrison's soldiers killed hundreds of, of Indians. Um, and then after the battle was over, they the Harrison soldiers sort of invaded this village, burned it to the ground, dug up a cemetery, desecrated the graves. It wasn't great. Leading the Indian contingent in this village were two brothers, Tecumseh, one of the most famous Native Americans in history, and Tenskatawa, also known as the prophet, his brother, who really is the main character of this story. And there he is on the screen, Tenskatawa. So Tenskatawa, the prophet, was celebrated by many Indians as having magical powers. They really believed he did. He, he could see the future, they thought. For example, he allegedly brought himself back from the dead and predicted a total eclipse. He was the one who led the Indians in this defeat at to Harrison's troops at, at Tippecanoe. Later, after it was all over, he learned of what Harrison's soldiers did to their village and naturally was not pleased with it. Many, many years later, after Harrison had built a, a long and, and esteemed political career, the prophet was near death. And on his deathbed, he predicted that Harrison would eventually become president, but then die in office. And subsequently, every president elected in a year ending in zero would also die in office. So sure enough, in 1840, Harrison was elected president with the campaign slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Tyler alluding to his running mate, John Tyler, but in Tippecanoe calling back this great triumph over Native Americans 30 years before. So even then it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a big, a, a big moment in, in Harrison's career. But Harrison, after he became president, actually went on to have the shortest term in presidential history. He actually got sick and died shortly after giving his inaugural address. Now, for a long time, the story always was that he gave his inaugural address on a cold, rainy day in Washington without a top coat, got a cold, turned into pneumonia, eventually died. More recent historical research suggests that that's not what did it. It was a tainted water supply near the White House that actually caused the infection that eventually led to Harrison dying. One way or another, Harrison died just a few weeks after uh, becoming president. So if you believe in the curse, the curse came true. Six more presidential deaths would follow over the next century plus. Ronald Reagan was the one who broke the streak after he was elected in 1980, survived his presidential term, left in 1989. But if you recall, Reagan was shot and very nearly died in 1981. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a second. So all of this is a, a chilling little tale, right? And it, when you take it at face value, and there's enough there to at least acknowledge the possibility of a curse. That being said, there are lots of problems with this, right? Like for instance, starting with why wait until Harrison became president? Why wait 30 years to curse the dude? You're that upset with him. What happened was terrible. You curse him right then. You don't, why wait that long? Then why take down other presidents with him? Like, what did they do? Why have it spill out into beyond him or whatever he may or may not have deserved? And then even more so, why only the presidents ending in zero? Why were they more deserving of death than the ones elected in a year ending in four or eight? So... The other aspect of it is there's no record of this story until 1931, almost 100 years after it allegedly took place when it was published in a Ripley's Believe It or Not article. And even then, there's no real evidence to it. You can't really track it back. It's a lot of anecdotal and circumstantial details, but it just kind of emerged out of nowhere. But as I said at the beginning, to be fair, it all stems from a creepy historical coincidence that really did happen. The first of many, as it turns out, most of which you've probably never heard of, including one that revolved around this guy, 
this guy on the screen here. So let's go back to 1861. Abraham Lincoln had just been elected president. The nation is on the brink of civil war. Lincoln's on his way to Washington from Illinois and a long winding train trip from Illinois down into Washington to be to for his inauguration. Along that path, he finds out and his advisors find out that his life is likely in danger. There are rumors of a planned assassination attempt on Lincoln in Baltimore and his last stop before coming into Washington. And along this journey, New York City's police department superintendent, the guy on the screen, was asked by Lincoln's associates to help look into this and ideally put a stop to it. So this guy travels down to Baltimore and by some accounts apparently did just that. He got to the root of the problem, found out it was true, convinced Lincoln to change his schedule, skip the stop in Baltimore and come into D.C. earlier than expected and unannounced. So he did that. Lincoln came into town. Very possibly this saved Abraham Lincoln's life and avoided a, an assassination attempt before he even became president. So this is an interesting story regardless. Like it's a pretty great, it's a pretty great tale. But it becomes even more interesting when you learn the name of the New York Police Department superintendent on the screen. His name was John Kennedy. So a guy named John Kennedy saved Abraham Lincoln from assassination before he became president. So that's a good story. And here's another one. So in terms of time and distance, the Lincoln and Kennedy assassinations are separated by 98 years and 1,300 miles. Today, the two physical items in which each president was shot are separated by about 150 feet. That is the rocker that Lincoln sat in there on the left and the Kennedy limousine on the right. Both are on display in the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan. And that's, this is totally by coincidence. They were never sought out to be displayed together. They were never intended to be displayed together. They just happened to wind up in the same place through very winding journeys. The one thing that they did have in common along the way is that nobody quite knew what to do with these two things after the assassination. The rocker sat in the basement of the Smithsonian in Washington for 30 years, just sat in the basement. Nobody knew what to do with it. We couldn't put it on display, but we can't get rid of it. What do we do with it? We throw it in the basement, sat there for 30 years. Eventually, by the time we hit the 1890s, it was put on display. It was then sort of okay to do that. Eventually, it was bought by Henry Ford as Henry Ford was putting together his museum in 1930. Even more incredibly, the limousine in which Kennedy was shot, actually stayed in service for 14 more years after the assassination. And that just blows people's minds. They can't believe that that's true. You would think immediately it would have been destroyed or taken out of service. No, it just, it stayed in service. Now it was largely gutted. And even by looking at the picture, you can tell it looks very different. All the parts of this car, certainly all the visible parts were sort of replaced one by one over the years. It was eventually retired in 1977 and put on display in the Ford's Museum in 1981. And it, it like I said, you, it looks very different today, largely unrecognizable, but it's still, it's still very powerful to sit there and, and look at the thing and think about what happened in that spot or with that item. Another off forgotten detail of both assassinations is that the presidents weren't the only people hurt in the assassination. Both were accompanied by other couples and the other gentleman in the party was severely injured. On the left, Major Henry Rathbone was sitting in the, in the presidential box at Ford's Theater with his then fiance, Clara Harris. He was actually stabbed by Booth after Booth had shot Lincoln. Before Booth could jump to the stage, he stabbed Rathbone to prevent him from, from stopping him and uh, was, was very seriously hurt. Texas Governor John Connolly there on the right was hit by one of the bullets shot at Kennedy sitting right in front of him in the lim in the limousine, and he very nearly died. Both Rathbone and Connolly wound up surviving. Um, and Connolly actually went on to have a successful, a little bit star-crossed political career. He actually almost became Richard Nixon's vice president right before Watergate. So in retrospect, he became very close to becoming president himself about a decade after the Kennedy assassination, but that was always what he was best known for as being the other guy in the car who was injured during the shooting of Kennedy. Rathbone, on the other hand, was the real tragedy here. He suffered from what we now know as PTSD and severe guilt 
at not stopping Booth. He really put it on his shoulders that he could have stopped the assassination had he moved quicker, act, acted faster, done something different. He blamed himself for the death of Abraham Lincoln. And he was shrouded by depression for the rest of his life. He started to suffer from paranoia and headaches. And eventually, tragically, he murdered his wife, Clara Harris. They wound up getting married, moved to Germany, and in a in a in a fit of desperation and sadness, he he murdered her and then tried to stab himself to death. He survived, afterward had no memory of the whole thing. He blamed it on men hiding behind paintings in the walls. And so he spent the rest of his life in an asylum. And that's, I mean, that's a creepy little story, right? That that very few people know. And it's it kind of like the similarities between the stories um, surrounding the two buildings from which the shots were fired. These two buildings, Ford's Theater on the left and the Texas School Book Depository on the right. They have a lot of similarities, even before the assassinations. Both were actually nearly destroyed shortly after being built. Ford's Theater, there was a, there was a big fire. There was a faulty gas meter at one point and a, a big fire broke out that nearly, that required a, a massive remodeling of the, of the building. The depository was actually struck by lightning not long after it was built and burned to the ground and was rebuilt from the foundation. Both buildings also served multiple, a myriad of, of various purposes before finally becoming what we now know them as. And both were haunted, figuratively haunted, by the assassinations for many, many years after. Both were then subsequently nearly destroyed after the assassination uh, for different reasons. People didn't quite know what to do. Just like with the with the chair and the limousine, they didn't quite know what to do with these buildings. For both of them, there were threats of arson and and plans of outright demolition, planned demolition. Ford's Theater actually became an office building for a while, a few years after the assassination, again, because nobody knew what to do with it. And in 1893, during a construction project, three floors of the building collapsed and 22 people were killed. And ironically, at the moment that that happened, on that summer day in 1893, John Wilkes Booth's brother, Edwin, was laid to rest. He had died two days before, and his funeral took place at the exact moment that Ford's Theater collapsed in Washington. So at this point, people really, truly started to believe that this building was, was cursed. This was bad news. It was, at this point now, it was unstructurally sound. For a few years after that, it was used as a, as a, as a warehouse, and there was a very calm and quiet plan to condemn the building and just knock it down. So it hung in there uh, for, for various reasons until around the 50th anniversary of the Lincoln assassination in 1913, the tide began to turn and there started to be more of a respect, more of an appreciation for the importance of this thing, not just it's this tragic building that we don't want to look at anymore. And so Ford's Theater at that point started to kind of find its niche and eventually evolved into the historical site that, that we know it as today. Meanwhile, the Texas School Book Depos Depository similarly was a was an eyesore. Nobody liked it. Nobody knew what to do with it. It caught fire mysteriously. Caught fire twice in the in the in the couple of decades after the assassination. Both of which were almost certainly arson in an attempt to to burn the thing down. Um, pe it, people were ashamed of it, just like with Ford's Theater. People were ashamed. The people of Dallas were ashamed of the depository. They, in a way, in a weird way, blamed the building and. They just didn't want to look at it, even though that the, in both cases, the buildings, the businesses within those buildings had nothing to do with the assassination, had no role in it, had no fault. It didn't matter. They just wanted them to they wanted them gone. They didn't want to look at them. So it took a long time for them to, to become historical sites. It was a very gradual progression. Now, fortunately, they did. And both are very powerful and meaningful experiences. That, it, that reflect and respect the events that, that took place there. Combined, more than a million people visit these two sites every year. And in both cases, it's just an amazing evolution of history and, and public perception and, and a heck of a story to tell. Another good one that doesn't make a lot of lists is the similarities between the buildings in which each wounded president was taken to die. For Lincoln, it was a boarding house across the street from Ford's Theater known as Peterson House. For Kennedy, he was taken to Parkland Hospital, Metropolitan Hospital, just outside of Dallas, uh, where, where he eventually was pronounced dead. And even though this is the most, perhaps the most obvious uh, coincidence of all, it still gets overlooked, even though the coincidence is right in front of our face between these two. You have the Peterson House 
and Parkland Hospital. Both start with P and H. It's real simple. Doesn't take much to crack that code. Here too, similar to the buildings, these spots didn't quite embrace their historical significance immediately, if at all. Peterson House eventually became part of the Ford's Theater Museum experience. Like now today, you can buy a ticket and go into both, just run across the street and, and, and hit both of the, both of the um, experiences. Um, and it was actually a museum before Ford's Theater was a museum. There were all kinds of artifacts that were stored in there, including artifacts that were all in the sort in the death room, which you see in the in the image there on the screen. Um, the Lincoln's death room, which they still call it that today, believe it or not, but it was loaded with artifacts. Most of those artifacts were eventually moved across the street to the, the museum, the great museum in the basement of Ford's Theater. Um, but it was really the first of the four that became a museum. And of those four locations, Peterson House is today still the most authentic and the least changed of the four, both outside and in. Like we're talking like the bricks or the original bricks, the window panes or the original window panes the railings on the outside, the interior staircase banister on the inside, and even the original floorboards. One of the great things that most of the tour guides tell you when you go in there is like if you when you rock across that floor and hear those squeaks, those are the same squeaks that the folks were hearing on that night in April of 1865. It's the same floor. It's the same squeaks. It's a pretty powerful experience. And you can visitors can basically touch all of this. Like you can touch the banister. You can touch the floor. These things are 200 years old. There's nothing stopping you from touching. It's a very impressive, tactile, historical experience that you don't get very much at all. So the Peterson House is, is really a powerful, very powerful place to, to visit. Parkland, meanwhile, before and after the assassination, was a busy metropolitan hospital. So there really wasn't any way. You can't turn that thing into a museum. There's not a whole lot you can do there. People can't just come in and, and, and visit it. They did eventually put up a plaque outside of the, the room on the screen there. It's Trauma Room 1. That's where Kennedy was taken and, and worked on and, and pronounced dead. They did put a plaque outside of the door there um, not long after. About a decade after the assassination, um, Parkland went through a, a, a major renovation and Trauma Room 1 was, was, was basically ripped out and was in essence what replaced it was a closet so it was a total revamp of the entire layout of the building and and it was now trauma room was gone the plaque was still there but it was you know outside of a closet so it's very different experience and actually then now just earlier this year the that of uh, that lo original parkland hospital building was demolition was completed on that it's been slowly gradually being um uh, torn down for the last couple of years it had moved to a much larger, nicer facility across the street about 10 years ago, and it's just gradually been ripped down. And so just earlier this year, it's it's totally gone. So of the four primary historical locations involved in the assassinations, um, the hospital is the only one not standing, the only one not to embrace its historical significance, which is kind of interesting. Another big coincidence that that doesn't get overlooked was the similar fates of the two assassins, principally that they were both able to escape the site of the assassination and evade capture. For John Wilkes Booth, it was 12 days. For Lee Harvey Oswald, it was about 90 minutes. Along the way, each of the assassins either ruined or ended a handful of, of people's lives on their, on their escape routes. But the main coincidence is that both were killed themselves after being captured, but before being brought to trial which is pretty rare. I mean, even in the historical times, that's that's pretty rare. And that both were killed by completely wackadoodle characters who really had no part in the story of either assassination. Booth was killed by Boston Corbett there on the left. Boston Corbett was a religious zealot who, in retrospect, was almost certainly clinically insane for, for most of his life. For example, many years before any of this happened, he had castrated himself after a prostitute had talked to him. So that's what we're talking about there. Corbett was actually part of the cavalry that that was set out to search for Booth. And they caught up to him at a farm that he was hiding out at in Virginia. And when Booth was trapped in a barn, a tobacco barn, uh, surrounded by soldiers trying to flush him out, Corbett shot him through an opening in the planks. And when asked, why did you do that? Corbett said that God told him to do it. So instead of putting Booth on trial and, and getting answers that remain un unanswered today, he died along with whatever additional details there might have been. And Corbett became something of a celebrity for a while after this. Uh, he eventually, though, his, his mental illness caught up with him. He was put into an asylum, later escaped, and uh, 
honestly was lost to history. We don't know what happened to him after that. Oswald's assassin, on the other hand, is, is a little more familiar. As most of us know, two days after the assassination, as Oswald was being transferred from the city jail to the county jail, Jack Ruby impulsively walked up and shot Oswald in the parking garage of Dallas Police Headquarters. Ruby was essentially a nobody. He was a wannabe. He ran a strip club in Dallas. Like Corbett, he had some mental issues most of his life. And contrary to what most conspiracy theorists will tell you, like most things in his life, Jack Ruby shot Oswald impulsively. On some level, he thought that by killing Oswald, he would save Jackie Kennedy from having to testify at a trial. He n honestly never thought he would get into trouble. He knew a lot of the cops. He was buddy-buddy with them. He thought they'd give him on a pat in the back and, and just send him along on his way. He just never anticipated that this was a problem. The other funny thing about, about Jack Ruby is that a lot of people theorize that Ruby killing Oswald, silencing Oswald in a way, proves that there was a conspiracy, that that's what he was sent there to do. <laughs> but when you really think about it, the, in, the opposite is true. Silencing Oswald didn't shut down the rumors of conspiracy. It kept them alive. It launched them, basically, and kept them alive. And one of the big arguments against the conspiracy theory is that it was pure happenstance that Ruby was there at that time. Oswald was shot at 11.21 a.m. At 11.17 a.m., four minutes before that, Jack Ruby was standing in line at a Western Union office a block down the street. Like, there was no sense that he was preparing to do what he was about to do. On top of that, Oswald was supposed to have been transferred at 10 o'clock. It had been announced to reporters the night before that it was this transfer was going to happen at 10 o'clock. If they're there at 10 o'clock, they can get film of him. That's what they wanted. They wanted to shout questions at him. Be here at 10 o'clock. We're going to transfer him. There was no sense that it was going to be an hour and 20 minutes late. They had planned on doing it at 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock on Sunday morning, Jack Ruby was sitting in his underwear in his apartment. He had just woken up. There was no, again, no evidence of any sort of forethought or plan for this to happen. So the point is impulsively shooting Oswald matched Ruby's personality and behavior. And on top of that, it was he was absolutely the last person she would go to to do something like this and then try to keep it a secret. He just wasn't that guy. That's totally the wrong person to go to for this. Like Corbett, he Ruby really sunk into mental issues uh, after after killing Oswald. After his conviction, Ruby was eventually convicted and sentenced to prison. He said he could hear screaming in the walls. He thought it was people being boiled in oil in the basement of the jail, which if that sounds familiar, it's kind of like what Henry Rathbone was talking about when he heard voices behind the pictures in the walls when he, when he killed his wife. Ruby eventually did die in prison of cancer three years later. Some people see conspiracy there as well, which unfortunately comes with the territory. So what comes with the territory of this list of coincidences is the natural question that comes up, even for people who are interested or believe that these aren't just coincidences, the question comes up, so what? And it's a fair question. I mean, there's there are several theories, ideas, suggestions of what all this might mean. Some are crazy. Some are really crazy. Uh, one is synchronicity which is a bit of a philosophical term, meaning a, a meaningful coincidence that can provide guidance as if the universe is winking at you, is a clever way to put it. It can nudge you toward a decision or tell you that something's about to happen. And this is actually how the idea for my book originated in a, in a much earlier version of it, the, the something is about to happen bit. I tried to take that idea and turn it into a novel, essentially that a, a guy, a character in a story recognize the, the string of similarities between Kennedy and Lincoln and hypothesize that theoretically we could have predicted the Kennedy assassination based on what we knew about the similarities between the, between the two of them. And in retrospect, when you look back at the Reagan assassination attempt that I mentioned earlier, the one that ended the presidential curse, or at least the, that Reagan ended the presidential curse, surviving that ended the curse. If you dig into that, you can see similarities between the shooting of Reagan and the shooting of James Garfield in 1881. No one ever really did this because Reagan's was not a true assassination. It was an attempt, but not an assassination. So the, the string kind of ran out. But if you really look at it, Reagan and Garfield have the same number of letters in their name. 
The two shootings took place less than three miles apart in Washington. They took place exactly 100 years apart. Garfield was the 20th president. Reagan was the 40th president and so on. There's a, there's, there's a handful of others. Similarly, so the character in this story um, saw similarities between JFK and the fictional current president in, in his world and thought that the fictional president was going to be assassinated. So he tried to figure out, put all the puzzle pieces together, figure out when and where, and he was going to try and put a stop to it. So I tried for a while to make it work. The novel never really came together and finally realized that this worked better. It was actually more interesting as nonfiction uh, to me. And, and if you focused on just the facts, that was much more interesting than trying to fictionalize it. So I just kind of dove into that and tried to make that work. So even if you don't believe in the synchronicity thing, I mean, that's isn't that a cool idea? The idea that the universe, fate, destiny, whatever you want to call it, is trying to communicate with us. Another much weirder idea is that all of this suggests proof of an alternate dimension. And better still, that the best evidence suggesting this involves the Berenstain Bears. The Berenstain Bears being, if, I hope you're familiar with them, the sort of cartoon bears that had a line of books many, many years ago. The cartoon series, very well known. When you stop and think about the Berenstain Bears, how do you spell Berenstain? Is it B-E-R-E-N-S-T-E-I-N or B-E-R-E-N-S-T-A-I-N? It's a good question. People swear up and down that it's spelled S-T-E-I-N and remember it from their childhood. They remember seeing it on the books. They remember seeing it on television. It was, that's how it was. They swear up and down that that's how you spell it. It's actually S-T-A-I-N. It always has been. It's never been S-T-E-I-N. Now, there's lots of theories why, as to why there are people who swear that it's spelled a different way. One of them is, is that people pronounce the name slightly differently, which intuitively leads to homophonic variations of the spelling, but that's dry and boring. That's no fun. The more interesting theory, interesting theory, is that a time traveler went back to prevent a Y2K disaster and somehow caused a ripple effect, and that caused two dimensions to collide. And the people who remember it being spelled S-T-E-I-N are from one dimension. The people who remember S-T-A-I-N are from another dimension. <laughs> we'll leave that right there. <laughs> the more elegant term for this is called the Mandela effect. Uh, people have a memory of South, of South African President Nelson Mandela dying in the 1980s, dying in prison before he ever became president. Again, they swear up and down. They remember it. They remember the funeral. They remember the breaking news. It was big news that he died in the 80s, whereas we know that he was released from prison, became president, and died in 2013. So these alternate memories, these differing memories, like the Lincoln-Kennedy coincidences, some hypothesize, could be residue left over from when one timeline merges with another. Admittedly, that's a lot to unpack. Another theory is reincarnation. In other words, that John Kennedy was Abraham Lincoln reborn. Now, that sounds silly. Uh, it's it's a much more graceful and beautiful thought than than how we in America generally perceive it. It's a much more accepted idea and philosophy actually elsewhere in the world, primarily Asia, that the same soul unknowingly is is reborn and lives another life, generally either ending the same way or facing the same challenges, almost as if an exercise in evolution or resolution to resolve things from your previous life in your next one. Yet another theory is that this is just the tip of the iceberg in, in historical terms. There are other things like these coincidences littered throughout history, usually as independent little standalone things. For example, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams were both founding fathers of the United States, both signed the Declaration of Independence, both died just a few hours apart from one another on July 4th. 1826, the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, which is pretty cool. Mark Twain, arguably America's greatest writer, was born just as Halley's Comet appeared in, in 1835, and he died the day after it returned on its 75-year cycle in 1910. One of my favorites is Wilmer McLean. Wilmer McLean was a farmer in, in Manassas, Virginia in 1861. He had a farmhouse that was right in the middle of what would become the Battle of Bull Run, the first battle of the Civil War. And in fact, Confederate officers used Wilmer McLean's home as their headquarters for that battle. Once the battle was over, everything cleared out. Wilmer McLean's like, I don't, I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to be anywhere near this war. 
He moved his family 120 miles away to a tiny little town called Appomattox Courthouse, which might sound familiar. It was in Wilmer McLean's home four years later that Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses Grant to end the war. So the Civil War literally began in Wilmer McLean's backyard and ended in his front parlor, which is a pretty amazing story. And probably the, the, the spookiest of all. A few months before the Lincoln assassination, Robert Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's son, was traveling by train to Washington. At a stop in Jersey City, Robert Todd Lincoln was standing on the, on the platform and he was leaning back against a, a, a train that was, was standing still. That train began to move. It started to roll out. And Robert Todd Lincoln lost his balance as he was leaning against it and was about to fall into the, the, the opening between the platform and the moving train. And because the train was moving, he likely would have been very seriously injured and, and possibly killed. Some a bystander grabbed him, saw what was happening, grabbed him and pulled him back before he could lose his balance, pulled him back onto the platform and, and, and potentially saved his life. That bystander was Edwin Booth, John Wilkes Booth's brother, saved Robert Todd Lincoln's life. Edwin Booth, who was just happened to be there at that same time, traveling with John Ford, the owner of Ford's Theater. It's pretty amazing. So these things do happen. And it's in our nature to try to find order in things that may not be there. Some believe that there's a pattern to literally everything. We just may not be able to understand it. Like looking at clouds on a, on a summer day, we can, we could each see the, the same cloud and visualize something different, a car, a dog, a house, or, or nothing at all. But we can agree that a cloud is there. And in this case, we can agree that there is a long list of coincidences that does exist and whether or not it truly means anything or is anything beyond entertainment is, is up to each of us. So on that note, I turn it over to you and, and open up the, the virtual floor to any questions or comments or, or thoughts that anyone might have.